Here in Elstow, near Bedford, John Bunyan, son of a tinker who followed his father's trade, was born in 1628. Bunyan married a local lass, a godly woman under whose influence he was converted, and so he turned his back upon the rather arid, formal state religion of Charles I's reign. And by the time of Cromwell, he'd acquired quite a reputation as a down-to-earth sort of preacher. One scholar has described him as one of the greatest natural religious geniuses of all time. At the Restoration, John Bunyan went to jail in Bedford for preaching at an unlawful religious service. And it was during those spells in jail that he wrote the first part of The Pilgrim's Progress, deploying those magical skills with words which no doubt must have made him an irresistible preacher. Mark this and mark this well, John Bunyan. Thy preaching days died with Cromwell. As King Charles hath reclaimed his rightful throne, so shall the lawful religion of England have restoration too. Thou hast upheld unlawful meetings and conventicles. Thou hast persisted in that preaching for which thou hast neither authority nor calling. Thou art lawfully convicted for these things, and therefore art thou committed to prison. Yet, who calleth a man to preach? Who giveth authority but God alone? His calling stoppeth not for prison walls. A rumour runneth through Bedford that John Bunyan the Tinker, abetted by certain persons who shall have their deserts, doth on occasion privily steal forth from jail and in secret places preach to lawless gatherings. He was told long since that should he persist in his flouting of the law, he might yet be stretched by the neck. Who would true valor see, let him come hither. One here will constant be, come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement Shall make him once relent His first avowed intent To be a pilgrim Brothers and sisters in Christ For so I trust you be Makes my heart burn with love to see you so gathered I know well enough how you've come hither I know that your horses are tethered of farmsteads and in secret places that ye have come thence on foot so that the enemies of the gospel be not drawn to our meeting. But as ye come with pain, so ye must needs understand ye come in peril. There may well be one amongst us that is an informer. He knows well that I stand here only because God hath moved my kindly jailer's heart to give me an hour's respite. This be an unlawful assembly to which ye have come. As I could go to the gallows for speaking to you, so you for hearkening might be brought to the stocks, or seared with a branding iron, or flung into a dungeon. If there be any here whose heart quails at this, then go now. It may be that the informer hath not yet noted thy countenance, nor recalled thy name. So, ye are set to receive the word of God. But stay, is there not a face in yon tree peering through the leaves? Dost thou lurk and pry, sir, like a serpent in the boughs? <laughs> Nay, tis but a lad that like a second Zacchaeus hath climbed a tree to hear the word of God. See, Luke telleth that Zacchaeus was short of stature, so he got him up a sycamore tree the better to see and hear Christ. Thou too, lad, shall have God's word and doubt it not. But if there be an informer here, then I pray for his soul. May he depart, not informing, but himself informed and unto salvation. Amen. Ye have come then with trouble and peril, not to hear Master Bunyan the tinker prate, but to get tidings of salvation. And doubt not ye shall have God's word, for God himself hath shown me as I came hither what I must say. As I hasten from Bedford town, 
lest I be apprehended and taken too soon back to my prison home. I pondered deeply what I must do for folk that were set to hear me at so great a risk. I called to mind certain old crones whose talk overheard by me in my days of darkness was a lamp under my feet, the starting place of salvation. John Bunyan, I asked myself, canst thou do less for them that come in peril? Nay, thou must set before them life in place of death. Heaven for hell. But how am I to do it? By what scripture shall I open to them the means of glory? Ah, God careth dearly for your souls, for as I wrestled in my heart, there came his swift response. I gazed about the countryside. On a sudden, I spied a small figure at a distance, making his way at a great pace. So fast he ran, he moved in a cloud of his own dust. Here, to be sure, was one in haste. My own steps did quicken. Hear me, thought, is one sent by the justices to haul me back so that ye would wait in vain, but no. He took another road. He was bound for town. It was some great man's servant that ran. Dispatch mayhap to order wine and viands for a great feast, or to command the seamstress that my lady must needs have her gown by the Sabbath and that without fail. He ran, I warrant, upon some such great matter. A word then came to me of the Apostle Paul, where he saith to the Corinthians, so run that ye may obtain. The Lord then did show me in his picture book, the world, what scripture I must open to you. I saw that indeed the fellow was some gentleman's livery. He was a footman, belike, or someone of that sort. I recalled that Jeremiah, the talk of running with the footman. Footman, I, but the prophet's footman is no livery lackey. He is such a one as travels on foot in haste to a distant land. He is a seeker, a pilgrim. Such a footman would Paul have you to be. Be a footman that runneth for a distant land. I be a pilgrim. And be not held back. Is there someone here who shuns to run for heaven because of some gentle attachment which binds you to loved ones with sacred duties? When I was questioned by the justices, when I was commanded to leave off preaching and take my place in that church that is by man established, I soon began to hear the prison gate clanging about me. I thought then of my loved ones. The parting with my wife and child I knew would be like pulling the flesh from my bones. I thought most of all of my poor blind child, my Mary. Happy it were then and easy to have declared that sacred duties bound me to her. Poor child, thought I, what sorrow art thou like to have for thy portion? Thou must be beaten, must beg, must suffer hunger, cold, nakedness, and a thousand calamities. And all because I leave thee. I! But cannot endure that even the gentlest wind should breathe upon thee. The Lord then, in his mercy, put it in my mind to recall the cattle which were harnessed to a cart to carry the Ark of the Covenant to another country. Samuel doth tell that they were feeding their young, their calves depended on them. They would sorely cry after them, yet must they go for the word of the Lord's sake. And that was their sacred duty. And the only sacred duty that we have is laid upon us by God. It is to run for heaven. So run that ye may obtain. So run. What doth this so tell us? Now, our running, saith scripture, must have three properties. There is that swiftness of all running, which in the sixth of Hebrews is called fleeing. It is taken from Joshua, where we read that a man might flee to the city of refuge when the avenger of blood was at its heels. A running then for life, a running as we say, with all might and main. Again, a running must needs have that property which Paul doth call pressing. If we run for heaven, we must stick at no difficulty in the way. We must thrust, crowd, I press past all that stands between heaven and our souls. And would ye know what thing it is that is the greatest barrier? 
It is nothing other than the cross. Many I have known that have run and run for heaven. Then at length, life bringeth them across in their journey. They can go no further back. They fall to their old sins. Others I have seen that when they behold the cross in their path, why, they turn to left or to right like a balking horse. But there be very few that when they come to the cross can cry, as the martyrs did at the stake, O oh, cross, I bid thee good welcome. Be thou not daunted when thou comest upon a cross in thy journey. Tis thy surety that thou art on the right course. It belongs not to me to show to you in what shape your cross may be found. Ye will know it when the time doth come. It may be that for somebody here that time is now. Is there one here that through some suffering, some grievous loss, is even now tempted to murmur against God to forsake the true path? Beware. Beware. The devil will speak with a smooth tongue. He will whisper, it may be, in the accents of thy dearest well-wisher. Missed out. Quail, creep aside. Wish thy cross well hence. How hast thou deserved it? Resist the devil. In the world, saith the Lord, ye shall have tribulation, ye shall. It is a promise to them that run for heaven. Welcome your cross then, as Christ doth bid cheerily. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And here is a great wonder that ye shall find. When your cross is taken up and born, ye shall find it no burden, but a gold, a spur, that shall fetch from flagging limbs new strength. Behold yon thorn bush. If ye would scan it well ere ye leave this place, I doubt not that upon one cruel thorn ye will find a little dry drop of blood. For there last night did the faithful nightingale nestle with a thorn pressed to her breast that she might stay awake. So might she be sure of rising in the later hours to fill the night with song. So doth she take up her little cross that she might by and by rejoice Learn ye from the nightingale. So, as we flee for life, as we press through all hazards, so the third property of our running must be continuing. What doth Paul tell the Galatians? If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, mark well this running, or ye shall perish. It is not to run a little now and then by fits and starts, not to run halfway or almost thither, but to continue to the end. So run that ye may obtain. Obtain. There be many that run which do never obtain. They run, but they get no prize. Wilt thou be such a one? Thou must run in such a way as God directs. Dost thou profess the Christian faith? Is that enough, thinkst thou? There be many professors of the faith in this land. They suppose that to profess the faith is enough. How could it be so? What? Do you suppose that every heavy-heeled professor is running to glory? Every lazy-souled churchman that maketh easy profession with his tongue? I tell you, these run for heaven in the same manner as the snail creepeth upon the ground. And as ye would run to obtain, so ye must be mindful that the way is long. And as the way is long, so the time may be short. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, say not. I have time enough to run for heaven seven years hence. I tell thee this. It may not be seven days hence that the bell shall toll for thee. Wilt thou have started thy journey? And in this matter too, the devil will have at thee with all his guile. Take thine ease. It were time enough by and by to trouble thy conscience, to agitate thy spirit, to disquiet thy heart about salvation. Take thine ease, rejoice, and be thankful. And before Satan's whispers be dead upon the air, what then? Thou fool, thou fool, this night shalt thy soul be required of thee, Thou art doomed, thou art damned forever! Run! Run! Now flee the devil! See, that man in Joshua ran because the avenger of blood was in pursuit. Hearken now to these dreadful tidings. 
Thou too art pursued, I hotly pursued, by a savage pack even now hounding at thy heels. Who are these fearsome hunters that would have thy life? None other but these. The devil, the law, sin, death, and hell. The devil. Oh, he is nimble. He runs apace. He hath overtaken many. He seeks to trip up your heels and give you an everlasting fall. And after that fall ye shall have not one, but legions of devils for thy company, so that thou shalt run mad for anguish and torment. And the law, I speak of the ancient law of Moses. This law is a hunter well armed. He hath ten great guns. He hath the Ten Commandments. See, by them did those professors of the faith that wrangled with Christ, doctors, scribes, lawyers, Pharisees, think to win salvation, but they were damned, and Paul doth truly see that of the commandments cometh only despair. No man can of his own righteousness seek to satisfy that law. I warrant to be a man here today that saith in his heart in true earnestness, I keep God's law. I own but one God. I bow to no images. The Lord's name to me is holy. I keep the Sabbath, honor my parents. I refrain myself from murder, adultery, theft. I never bore false witness and I covet no man's goods. Art thou such a one? Thou? Thou? Tremble, be in mortal fear. Even as thou statest thy claim to righteousness, all is lost. Thou hast fallen back, thy treading hath slipped. Thou stickest in stinking mire, thou shalt never have the prize. And hell, this hunter is after thee with a terrible heat. It chaseth thee with mouth agape. Dost thou think thyself waxing hot from thy running? It is the breath of hell mouth that is upon thee. In many terrible dreams sent of God in the days of my wickedness, I have seen that mouth, a wide mouth, a hungry. My skin could even now scorch as I recall that breath. And how may ye fall into this dreadful hell mouth? Why, say ye, for a season I will have done with running for heaven. I will take pleasure for a space. Take thy pleasure, but be sure of this. Hell mouth that slappeth thee. One hour of hell will burn out all the enjoyment thou hast had in earthly things. And then thou shalt suffer untold pains for ever and ever and ever. Ay, thou art pursued indeed. Look not behind. Run and run and run. So run that ye may obtain. I unmark this. To obtain ye must run upon the right road. See, I was told a tale of a fellow that for a wager did boast that he would run from London to York. Stout-limbed fellow and a strong. Aye, but not so strong in his wits. Full bravely he ran, full swift, aye, but he also ran full south. Every step he took brought him further from his prize. It was the wrong road and with a vengeance. I am the way, saith Jesus. Find that one true way today. Mistrust thine own strength, mistrust all churches, all sects, even that to which thou dost belong. They may be apt for edifying, for sharing godly counsel. They are not of themselves salvation. When the justices demanded to know of me what church I profess to belong to, I could make none other reply than this. The church of God. We are in no church of man's building today. The leaves are our canopy, heaven's arches are our ceiling. Your benches are tussocks, my pulpit is a mound. Likewise, if I speak as to doctrine and allegiance, I warrant we have little conformity. We be many sects, we are a mixed throng. But the church of God, the one true church of God, is notwithstanding in this place. We look into the sky. As ye watch, ye shall see all manner of birds, great and small, dun-hued and gaudy, wheeling and tumbling in the joy of the freedom of heaven. So shall it be with the blessed. It shall not matter what cloak they wore, what sect they met with, so long as they did seek and find Christ. Look beyond thy sex, beyond thy churches, if thou wouldst find thy saviour. Some of you walked along the banks of the stream as you came hither. Why, quoth one to another, would that the water in our well at home were sweet and clean as this. 
the river in our town hath been befouled by man. The waters of the stream are sweet because they are close to their source. Then go ye to the source of salvation, which is Jesus alone. There thou shalt have the fountain of the water of life freely. No church, sister, no chapel well, no sectarian pump will give what he will give. Dost thou trust in creed, catechism, orderings of service, forms of prayer? Then stop! Stop thy running, my friends. Thou runnest on the wrong road, runst thou ne'er so bravely. And here we are at the heart of all that God would say to thee today. Trust nothing but Christ. Nothing. It is so weighty a matter, so serious, that my spirit doth ache with fear that thou mayest too little regard it. The land through which we travel is like unto a spider's web for the maze of roads, paths, and byways that lead out to baffle, to mislead. There is but one true road. I tell thee with tears, that I once stood in the awful peril of supposing that I stood in righteousness. I fell in eagerly with the religion of the times. I went to church, I said, I sang. I had a great devotion to the high place, the priest, the clerk, the vestments. I was even a servitor in religion's cause. I was a brisk talker and I was acclaimed as such. I thought that no man in England could better please God than I. The devil had me! But Almighty God doth send his angels in strange guise. I have spoke of those two old crones that came to my thoughts as I journeyed hither. On the day that I saw them, they were sitting in a doorway, heads close together, tongues a wag, bonnets askew, roomy eyes alight. Oh, I laugh to see them so. Only linger a while, I told myself, and I shall have from these the choicest gossip of Bedford Town. <laughs> but no, there was no gossip. Their talk was of salvation. They spoke of a new life. They told each other of their wretchedness of heart before they came to Christ. They scorned and abhorred the sort of righteousness that was my own boast, as though it were a garment of filthy rags. And as I listened, I was troubled, but as yet I understood not the devil would not let me move so fast. Peace, peace, he whispered. Is John Bunyan to be put down, to be stricken but to the heart by the chattering of two old women? I would fain have heeded him. And yet, and yet, whenever my thoughts returned to them, their talk went with me. And I began to see the gulf which yawned between their state and mine. Beneath the marks of poverty, the scars of time, they had, like hidden treasure, the tokens of true godliness, joy, peace. They stood on the sunny side of some high hill, refreshing themselves with the pleasant beams. I, for all my righteousness, all my religion, stood shivering and shrinking in the cold. I longed to join so happy a company, but I could not find the way. I perceived only my own grievous lack. I saw that all those things in which I had put my trust were now turned to ashes. The brisk talker was confounded by the simple. I fell into despair. I was cast into midnight darkness, even under feeling that I had betrayed Christ. So I endured two dark years, lighted only by a fitful star as I studied God's word. At last, I was empowered to say, get thee behind me, Satan. I came to Christ's peace. The words of the old women were with me still, but now they were become my own. They shone with radiant clarity. My own righteousness was now abhorrent to me. Like those women, I saw that my sins were great, that my sins were many, but like them, I now understood Great sins do draw forth great grace. It was as if Christ spoke to me as he spoke to Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. And I can tell you that on that day when I saw clear the truth about my state and the mercy of my Lord, 
I broke out into a sob of joy. Oh, it was no chapel mumble, nor no chancel chant. It was the song of the prisoner whose fetters are struck off and lie about his feet. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise the Lord. Praise him for his goodness. Praise him for his greatness. Thus, beloved in Christ, did my running start in very truth on the right road in the right fashion. Oh, I pray that there be among you one man, one woman, one child whose feet do now begin to twitch for the same journey. That is John Bunyan's prayer. But the prayer of our Savior as he looks upon you, moves amongst you, is that every heart might be resolved to run to him. Every heart. He gazes upon your faces one by one. He sees into your hearts. Dost thou make him weep? Is there somebody here who is set against the Savior's pleading, one who hath not received the word of God, but only heard this tinker prate? Poor soul, poor lost dying soul. Were I but skilled in lamentation, my eyes would run with rivers of water for thee. Thou should lose a limb, a child, a friend, thou wouldst think it much, but poor wretched lost creature, it is thy soul that thou art said to lose. But what can I do for thee more? I swear before the Lord that if for me to be hanged from yon gallows might be a means of arousing you, then I should be well content. But thy soul is thine own, thou must decide. Thou losest not my soul by thy sloth, thy sin, thy hardness of heart. It is thy own peace, thy hope which is in peril. The goldsmith, we must believe, intended not his jewels and rings for the snouts of swine. Oh, but enough of them that to resist the Lord. There be others. I, I have prayed that there be others. If thou be one that hath received the word of God this day, if God hath so used me that thou art awakened and set to run, then am I more honoured and blessed than if he had made me emperor of the whole Christian world or Lord of all the glory outside Christendom. I must leave thee now. Whither I go, thou knowest, my home is a prison cell. Yet am I a free man in Christ. My body returns to locks and bars, but the feet of my spirit are free to run. And they draw nigh to the sunlit slopes of Mount Zion. So run that ye may obtain. Run betimes, run now, run apace, run continuing, run I above all along the right road. To all of ye that now be said to be pilgrims, may the Lord give thee a prosperous journey. May we look to meet in joy when he hath bidden us enter the heavenly gate. Farewell. Amen. 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 Amen.